um, the benefits of leveraging both settings together uh, is going to be able, it's going to help us best meet the individual's need as partners. Um, so we increase opportunities for AAC practice at school, and I and we can talk about some ideas that I have around that or some ideas that you all are already doing, I'm sure, around that. Um, using equipment library for thorough and complex evals at a clinic. So we can do um, some, some of our complex evals with our equipment that we have here at CASC. And then if we get the device through our through insurance, it's personal device ownership. You, you, it's yours, you can do what you want with it. Um, so, and this part is, I'm starting to get, my brain is starting to want to talk to you about this other, this project that I'm to, talking to you about in three slides, uh, but we can make successful AAC matches. We can get through that first part. Remember all those circles at the beginning of this talk? We can get through that first part a lot more quickly if the two sides, if the if our outpatient and school teams work together, and really you cut some some of the having to learn how to use external symbols before we can evaluate you out of that process. Uh, obviously, the real experts of the individual are the family. Uh, they spend the most time with those children, their children usually, and then cl our clinic team. What we bring to the table in the program I'm going to talk to you about is our expertise related to technology. Um, you're having trouble getting funding here. Let's find out about TEP. We can talk about TEP. Uh, and we can talk about some of the other funding mechanisms that we have. And we also talk about brainstorming implementation strategies. So oftentimes during the trial period, which for those of you that aren't sure of what a trial period is, after we make a feature match, insurance requires that you try the device for a month and we collect data during that month. And I would say 85% of the time, the family is like, I don't even know how I'm gonna collect data on this device or where I'm supposed to use it because they're thinking they have to use it all day. So a suggestion that I oftentimes make is like pick a routine and start there and then broaden out from that point. And so some of that, because we do AAC all day, every day is, is more readily available for us to come up with some creative problem solving for implementation strategies. Um, I think it's important for us to leverage both set, like the benefits, the perks from both settings, if we can leverage them together, we can help accommodate the problem that are, the problems that are out of our control, right? So practitioners, whether you're in a school or in an outpatient clinic, the participation and buy-in from the team is something that can maybe impact the success with an AAC. But if we get the AAC device in, or the AAC system in place earlier, that may we may be able to sway the team by developing, by demonstrating and developing skills. Uh, but more importantly, the factor that's out of our control that I think is causing frustrations for families, frustrations for teams, and uh, in general, me, <laughs> uh, is that there are varying times for vendors to be able to send out a loaner device for you. And there are varying times for vendors to be able to get the purchase paperwork through the funding process. And then sometimes those varying times require you to have to go back and get another note from the doctor. And so those parts, we don't have any control over. The parts that we do have control over is like, how quickly can we get a tool in this kid's hand, this student's hand, so that they can start to manipulate language out here and begin to make connections of this is how we co-construct meaning together. Uh, Before I dive into some current efforts that have informed me about how much I don't know about AAC and have changed my approach to making more AAC nerds, I want to just talk about there are basically three fundamental things that we need to do to be thinking about integrating AAC. One of them is identifying predictable social situations. Now, I'm talking about integrating AAC in a way that is digestible for a team that's already spread too thin. So if we identify predictable social situations, we set up a routine for the kid to get practice, and it's not this extra, it becomes just a, a, a habit as part of this routine that we do every morning. And at first, it's easy to practice this routine, and then eventually you start to wait for the student to initiate the routine themselves, and you're starting to build the social skills that need to that, that are needed to become a proficient AAC user. 
Obviously, I think we know about core and fringe vocabulary. Core vocabulary is going to work for you in all kinds of settings. It's, it's like 80% of the words that we use in a given day are core vocabulary. They don't actually carry a lot of content, or I shouldn't say that. They don't actually carry a lot of specialized content. That specialized individualized content is, is called fringe vocabulary. So for me, um, I was, I, believe it or not, I was talking about fringe vocabulary earlier today, and I said something about something being wicked hot. And the word wicked is because I used to live in New England. So somehow I've gotten that word as an adjective instead of what it actually is. Um, but that wicked word is a fringe vocabulary word. And I think sometimes, I think core vocabulary is important. It is 100% important. Sometimes getting buy-in from the student is not going to be happening from core vocabulary. But if you give me fringe vocabulary that allows me to talk about Taylor Swift at the Super Bowl, I'm probably going to be more motivated to get into that system. And then, of course, the core vocabulary, it's not either or here either. They, they play well together. Um, I think... Other things that we need to be doing better in our outpatient clinics and in our schools is moving beyond labeling and requesting items and thinking about the other communication functions and not just social etiquette, please and thank you, but also social closeness. Like, man, did you see that rainstorm this morning? Geez, it's hot in here. Things that allow you to feel connected to other people are, are, are where we should be moving when we're trying to integrate AAC. In the event that I'm preaching to the choir here, though, I'm going to move on to talking about some actions that we've taken here and that actually were in place here before I took over my role as director um, that are aimed at bridging that gap in terms of how do we get a and the gap, I guess I haven't defined. So go back to step one. How do we get students better supported in schools? How do we support therapists to get those students their devices? And how do we do? How do we leverage what the infrastructure of an outpatient center provides to help do that? Um, so actions aimed at bridging that gap are within our Wasteman Center programs, and I'm going to talk about four, all four of our programs. So we have a direct service outpatient center, communication aids and systems clinic. We have an educational and outreach program that some of you maybe have been to, similar to this. Uh, we call that ECHO AAC. We bring in experts to talk about topics, and then we have a case study afterwards, and we all kind of brainstorm around solutions for that case study. And really, that whole point of that program is not is to decentralize knowledge, democratize knowledge. But my favorite part about that is that there's like this hive mind, creative community of practice that that gets to start that is being built. Um, the third program and the third and fourth programs are the ones that I want to talk about in terms of being aimed at bridging a gap from outpatient centers to schools, but also we can talk about like to the community in general. Uh, one of those is our oldest program here at the Wasteman Center that focuses on AAC. That's the communication development program. It's Dane County specific. I think it's worth talking about because I think we should maybe be exploring options for other counties to take on similar models. And then the other program I'm gonna talk with you about is our partnership program. And that one is the one that we're gonna start with. We have a contract, a small contract for piloting a program with the Department of Public Instruction. I should have had this slide on here while I was telling you what my programs are. I apologize. Uh, I, I like to help people. I think when people think about AAC at Wasteman, they think about CASC and they don't think about these four, these other three distinct entities. And I just like to share that when I have the chance to do so. Good news though, we get to see this slide a few more times in this talk. So the two programs I'm going to be talking about are the direct service outpatient model. That's like, you guys know what this is. You get an evaluation for 90 minutes. And then we write a six month plan of care. Ideally, we've made a feature match in 90 minutes. Now I'm gonna tell you, I don't know that we always, I mean, I can tell you, we don't always make a feature match in 90 minutes. So if we don't, then we have that six month plan of care, help us keep working through features that might be helpful to an individual until we find a match. Then we find a match, we do the trial, et cetera. Uh, and then once we get someone matched, we then 
send them to their community for supports. Because if we keep them here and we train all the skills in the clinic, research has shown us time and time again that that does not translate to the community. Um, our AAC partnership program started uh, by Sarah, Cal Sarah Marshall and Kat Cantor uh, in 2019. And the idea was to, so recognizing this giant wait list, how can we start to get some of these people off of the wait list? Well, let's leverage the community resources that some of these people have already. So if they have a speech pathologist in the community, can we support them in doing the evaluation, getting the device and getting into the, the implementation piece? So the partnership program, you come the, uh, it, to get in, the speech pathologist refers the student to our team. Our team does a triage process that lets us know if insurance is gonna cover the services scheduling, consultation, that sort of thing. Once we've had a consultation with you beforehand to kind of find out more about the student and what your goals are for the evaluation, where you are in the AAC pipeline, um, we bring you in for that evaluation. And then that is a one-time visit, 90 minutes. And hopefully we've done all the legwork beforehand for that 90 minute evaluation to go off without a hitch. Sometimes we do have to bring people back. Uh, it, after that evaluation, we write, we write an evaluation report for, from us, and then we support the, the therapists in the community to build capacity for the, themselves to be able to write reports. What I have learned from this program is that there are, and I, sh I should have known this, but this program has made it abundantly clear, there are two types of speech pathologists out there in the world of AAC. Some of us want to be AAC nerds, and some of us are like, man, I am a generalist. I like all these things and I do not have time to get into the, the level of detail that you're asking me to do through this program. And so that's something I wanna talk about today after I get through some of this data, but thinking about how can we have support for the generalist while also building capacity for those folks that want to become more specialized um, in AAC. And most of, after you do your initial evaluation with us, we provide follow-up support for about six months. Uh, and that's all virtual because the uh, what I've neglected to say about the partnership program is it is a statewide program. And I have some data for how far we have reached with the statewide program. I'm just trying to find a clock. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I have two projects right now that are evaluating the impact and or effectiveness of the partnership. I'm gonna talk about the first one and I forgot to edit out my X's, please ignore that. The first partnership pilot project is a, we looked at some, we looked at a focus group. I'm gonna talk about the questions we asked, but essentially we wanted to know from the focus group, what do you think about this unique service delivery model? How is it addressing this, this idea of building capacity and giving timely access to AAC services? How did you receive our coaching consultation? Was it helpful? What, is, what was missing? What did you gain from it? Uh, and we just don't have enough resources to complete AAC evaluations. The research shows that time and time again, which is what those X's were going to turn into. Um, I think really though, one of the giant, one of the lack of, the biggest lack of resources time for, for folks. Uh, all of the things that I'm going to be talking about with this partnership data is impossible without the work of Sarah Marshall, Kat Cantor, Annie Hinker, uh, Lauren Hammer, Kayla Christensen, and Abby Marks. So those are the people that are actually making this program run. I'm the person that's the nerd that wants to see if it's working. Uh, so the questions that we're asking are, does, does, and we're asking, I should tell you who our participants are. We have two sets of focus groups, one of which is uh, the speech pathologists from the community who've participated. And then the other focus group, which I don't have data for you today on, are how, what was the family's perspective of that, this having the two places come together process. These focus groups are supported by two doc students in uh, a Wasteman WISC lab, Helen Long and Marianne Lundquist, and also our clinical fellow, Cameron Bachelman. I'm not a person that doesn't like to give credit, so I have to say these things. Um, so, which areas of the programs were most helpful for folks that are participating? And we're today going to talk just about the speech pathologist. What areas could be improved? Um, do families feel supported in implementing AAC in home and community settings? 
and following participation in the AAC partnership program. Sorry about that acronym there. So these are questions for the focus groups. These are my participants for the focus groups. I only got nine speech pathologists to agree to talk to me about their experience. They were all female. Uh, they all have master's degrees. You can see the age distribution. Um, and we have, I thought it was interesting that seven of the people that I was able to get to participate in the focus group have 10 plus years of experience in AAC, which is an interesting data point for me. And then, excuse me, seven years of experience in, in speech language pathology. And then the highest is going to be moderately experienced Four people say that for their prior AAC experience. We do this interview, we ask them questions. I think there were nine or 10 questions that were specific about what brought you to the program? Um, what did you learn? Do you feel like you'd be able to do the evaluation yourself? And then I have students that transcribed those record, those interviews that are those focus groups that we did. And we generated themes that were talked about in each of the focus groups by all of, by each of the speech pathologists. So one of the emerging themes that's coming up is, is tied to expertise. So that AAC specialist, generalist tension was something that was coming up in all nine of our discussions. And so thinking, and, it, and the next steps are gonna be looking at these sub themes, which are what the bulleted points on the right are. How, how, does the, how are the years of expertise tied to how people are thinking about expertise? And I have a quote here from some, all of my quotes are direct quotes from our participants. I think it would have taken me, would have been an immense amount of time to do this if it was just me. And that's a school speech pathologist. I haven't interviewed my own speech pathologist yet to figure out how, how this program is impacting them. I have some ideas. Uh, then the other thing is like, why are you coming to our program? So the original idea was this program is going to build capacity. So you should come to the program and then you go out and do your AAC evaluations. But we started to see people were coming back to the program, which is cool. But what is causing you to come back to the program? Are we not addressing a capacity building need that you have? Uh, and then so we have this quote here. I feel like sometimes we're the general practitioners of S SLPs and we have to refer out to the specialist. I put this quote on here. Uh, because I want to challenge this perception. I think as speech language pathologists, our expertise is communication. And if you think creatively about communication and you think about what you're already doing with symbols and pictures and how that can be done with kids who have more complex communication impairments, I think you can start there and you can be a generalist that supports AAC. I have a lot of colleagues who have AAC under their repertoire of what they do. They also do fluency and voice and swallowing ask me any questions about that, I have no idea. There's value in both as both both forms of speech pathology. And I think I think that's where we can get some traction between our two set between the school and outpatient settings. More emerging themes and sub themes. What did you think about the process? Um, before the process and during the evaluation? What did you think about the process afterwards? Did we give you enough support? I mean, the CASC SLPs walked me through everything. So they felt well supported during the evaluation and even leading up to the evaluation. And then um, this quote here, all the insurance stuff, I have no clue, absolutely no clue how I would help those parents with any of that. And so this is coming to the question of like what was missing or what do you think would would is was readily contributed by the therapist at the specialty center. This is still very much in its emergent preliminary stages, uh, but stay tuned. There will be some articles that come out with this data. We also have questions about outcomes and future directions. Like if you had a magic wand, what would you want to see? Or what did you think about the outcomes of your participation in this program? And I think this quote is really cool. Honestly, the student did better than I even thought. So the evaluation of having the device was spot on. Um, and so, Part of that is like, I know the student is capable of something. You bring the expertise of an AAC specialist who's been looking at students with complex communication needs for 20 years, and then we can have someone perform really well. Not that that's required all the time, but that's what that quote is getting at, um, I think. That's the funny thing about focus groups. You, I, We haven't made it back to ask folks if they think that our themes are accurate. So the other thing that came up a lot, actually, more so than the other themes that I've already outlined for you, 
are external influences and how that is impacting access to AAC, the ability to support AAC, the ability to even participate in this program. Um, and so this quote kind of captures it all. I underestimated. And then also, excuse me, external influences are also getting teacher buy-in, getting family buy-in. And part of the challenge there is how much people think that those boxes are magic. And once we give a device to somebody, they're gonna be able to communicate. Uh, and when they're not able to communicate, there's something wrong with the device or there's something wrong with the student and neither one are actually true. But so here's some of the external influences. I think an important one that started to come out on the second phase of this project, which will be the next slide with our DPI um, collaboration is figuring out how we're gonna give time to people who already don't have time to be able to invest themselves to, to nudge the needle forward for a student um, in a school or in their classroom. Uh, and as I said, my family data for the focus groups hasn't been analyzed yet. Mostly my own time constraints have had that problem, have created that problem. Mm -hmm.